Springer, you're on. All right. Uh, I want to start uh, with very large principles and then keep referring back to those very large principles. And I'll go to our two founding documents, our philosophical mission statement, if you will, the Declaration of Independence, uh, the idea of natural rights, unalienable rights, the idea that the social contracts begins with a granting of those rights to people from a source of above all men. Uh, you define what that source is. And that the idea that government gets power from the consent of the government. Uh, and that the people get a fourth collective right to alter that government, and if it doesn't listen, abolish it. Those are sort of fundamental principles in the Declaration. The fundamental principles of the Constitution, in addition to federalism and checks and balances, and all that stuff, three branches, separation of powers, are in the preamble. Um, a more perfect union, um, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty. Uh, I'm going to keep referring back to those principles as we go through. You'll see where, <coughs> maybe you can anticipate it if, if I ask you. So, just so we can be very kind of uh, large picture oriented and I don't get too bogged down in the facts. Okay? So, we're going to start today, as I said, in Jeffersonian foreign policy. Uh, Jefferson's first uh, term, very successful in a lot of ways. Uh, one of the ways is that, well, Jefferson has this idea about the role of government into uh, the role of the private economy. Uh, oftentimes given a French label, that label being hands off, laissez faire, let it run itself. Government's job is to basically protect property, basically protect security. Uh, he really thought it should focus on foreign policy, but the private economy within, let it be. He also is, very much like uh, conservative uh, economists today, a, a balanced budget guy. He doesn't feel that government should spend more than what it has. Um, what did he significantly cut to help balance the budget in the first? <coughs> yeah, he cut it in half, more than half, gutted it, military. Keep that in mind as we go into Jeffersonian foreign policy. Um, the, his approach to government and what he had available to him uh, as, as he encounters these foreign problems that he rightly believes government should uh, involve itself in. So, um, we got to shift to Europe though first. In Europe, uh, war has been going on, revived in the 1802 or thereabouts, and we're kind of reaching a stalemate. A stalemate between the masters of the sea and the masters of the, of the land. Who, which European nation is the master of the seas? France, nor anybody else can conquer Great Britain on the seas. Who is the master of the, con uh, the continent? That's an easy one. Think of their leader at this point. He's running across the continent. Napoleon and France are running across the continent, and Great Britain can't stop them. And you have a stalemate. France is conquering everybody in the continent, but can't get to Britain on the seas. Britain has control of the seas, but can't stop France in the continent. And they're still at war. So they're looking for advantage in some way, shape, or form over it. And the way they're going to get advantage is through shipping, attacking neutral shipping. And the United States is a major trade partner of both. So in this instance, we're going to get hit from both sides. That's why the textbook has that title, uh, America, a nutcracker neutral. We are neutral, and we're getting squeezed from both sides, uh, France and Great Britain. And this is a problem, 1804, 1805, 1806. And both sides start passing uh, laws. Uh, start with, uh, I think it's the Berlin Decree, which is, tells you first of all where Napoleon is uh, at this point, is conquering. And he passes a decree that says any neutral trading with Great Britain is subject to seizure. Great Britain, not to be done, outdone, passes the Orders in Council. Anybody complying with the Berlin Decree, uh, and allowing uh, 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 searches by France, also subject to seizure, unless they come to Great Britain and pay a tax first. A law decree by France, anybody who complies with the orders in council are going to be subject to seizure. So we're getting hit from both sides. But Great Britain does one thing that France does not do as a practice that's really obnoxious. Impressment. Impressment is not showing off for sailors. Impressment is taking sailors, accusing them of leaving the British Royal Navy and forcing them into military service. And there's no due process. 
They just take them off of these merchant ships and force them into military service for the British Navy. It's kidnapping, essentially. So here's our challenge. France and Great Britain seizing our ships and our cargo. Great Britain, in addition to that, impressing soldiers. Jefferson's got to do something by 1807, 1806, really. I mean, so he's got to come up with some policy. Why not military? Why not military? Why, not, why an embargo? Because he cuts money in the military. There's a, we make it sound like this is a principal reaction of Jefferson. Maybe it was. He didn't have another option. He can't have a military response. We don't have one. Not worthy of doing it. So he comes up with the Embargo Act of 1807, and I love this phrase. Uh, it's so pretentious, <laughs> um, but it's so pretty at the same time. Peaceful coercion. And here's the, here's the quote. Uh, commerce is the only proper weapon of a civilized people. You see, even if we had an army, we wouldn't use it because we're civilized, unlike those warlike Europeans. Yeah. Uh, we're going to show them to respect our rights by not trading with them. Out of hurt. Who did it end up hurting? It hurts the shipping industry in New England. It hurts, it hurts building manufacturing in the middle colonies. It hurts agriculture in the South. It hurts mineral resources in the West. It hurts every area, every regional element of the economy in our country. Uh, I could give you the numbers, but trust me, imports and import, exports just go way down. In one act, Jefferson devastates every area of the economy. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't hurt Great Britain and France as much because, well, they have, France has the continent. They have plenty of resources, and Britain is the leading imperial power in the world. So it kind of backfires. Just before he leaves office, Jefferson replaces the Embargo Act, which essentially is a embargo on us, prevents us from leaving our ports with the Non-Intercourse Act. How does that change it? Anybody remember? It allows some ships to leave port for any port that's not Great Britain or France. The problem is there's very few lucrative port or ports that are not that. So let's get to some principles here. One, balanced budget, a, an economic approach, laissez-faire, conservative kind of economic philosophy. Uh, we will balance that with what the American system is. The government's role is to play back, let the private cycles, the private economy work its way out. Um, I think the blessings of liberty is in here. Um, the, the idea that individuals could go out on a ship and do their job and never come back is something we have to protect as a government. Um, and uh, I think that's all I had at this point. Uh, any questions on that? Regional economies is also something you want to get into, uh, how that's going to play out uh, in the next unit, okay, regional economies. So the transition point. Jefferson leaves. The economy is in shambles. Yes? I, it's just on the, it's on the video. You can get that on the, already. So I just chose not to start there. Okay. Um, if at the end you want to ask a question about it, I'll talk about it. Transition. Jefferson, third president, followed by which president? Madison. Number four, Madison, very much a disciple of Jefferson, was Jefferson's Secretary of State. He comes in, and he's going to try a different tack. Macon'sville number two. I have no idea what happened with Macon'sville number one. But Macon'sville number two comes in, and, and follow this. This is an incentive-based bill. I love this bill. It's incentive-based. Now, instead of embargoing ourselves or just embargoing trade with Great Britain and France, we're going to open trade to the world. Everybody. The whole world. You, most of the world. You, Great Britain. You, France. Open trade to all. You can trade to all. But to the belligerent powers, those at war, I mean, <coughs> Great Britain, right? France. We give incentives. If you, Great Britain, if you lift your orders and counsel, your restrictions on us, we'll impose an embargo on your enemy and give you the advantage in war. If you, France, lift your Berlin and Milan decrees on us, we will impose an embargo on Great Britain uh, and give you the advantage in your war. It's an incentive-based bill. Who responds to the incentive first? Oh, we don't know. France. The one we can't trust. Everybody knows you can't trust Napoleon. They respond first. And this is where they have the title of the book, Madison's Gamble. He knows Napoleon, but he gambles. He says, sure, great. And he imposed an embargo on Great Britain. What's Madison's Gamble? What's he hoping from Great Britain? 
What is he hoping from, for uh, Great Britain? He's not that he believes Napoleon. What's that? Yeah. And what else do we want? What did we want from you in the first place? What's the whole incentive? Get rid of your restrictions. He says they're going to get rid of them. That helps. Maybe I can get you to get rid of them. And now we're truly opening the world. It's a gamble. And it's a gamble that's going to kind of backfire. Because we impose an embargo on Great Britain. Do they lift their orders of council? Not right away. They resist, they resist, they resist. And it's not our pressure that eventually gets them to lift the orders of council. Who pressures Parliament to lift the orders of council? They're losing money in Britain. British manufacturers get them to lift the orders of council. Oh, wait, there's this problem. The problem is, is just as they're considering it, there's an assassination, the only assassination of prime minister in British history. They have to have parliamentary elections. It takes time. They get back to their parliament. They lift the orders in council exactly two days before we declare war. Actually, they suspend it two days before the, we declare war, and they officially revoke it five days after we declare war. Ooh, that gamble backfired because we had given Britain a 60-day ultimatum. You either lift your orders in council or we go to war. Madison makes his war message, emphasizes the orders in council, impressment is ship seizers. The assassination happens. They don't get it done in time. We declare war with that. The failure of the British to lift the orders in council as the primary cause. In our course, in our class, we do the five ironies of the War of 1812. This is number one. The stated cause for the war didn't exist when the war began. The primary stated cause of the war, the failure of Britain to lift the orders in council to stop ship seizures and impressment, it didn't exist. It was suspended and then revoked when the war began. So that brings to mind a question, why did we go to war? Because there's other causes. Cause two, the only other stated cause in Madison's war message before the War of 1812. Uh, a frontier confederacy. What's a confederation? We've talked but the sovereign states are American states in the frontier confederacy. Who are they? Native and who organizes Native American Federation, a confederation on the frontier? Who is the organizer? You can say it two different ways. Oh, you don't want to try either. It can be Tecumseh, it can, come, it be, it can be Tecumseh. Uh, one of the most brilliant people you ever want to study knew all these languages, formed the confederation of the frontier along with his brother, the prophet. Tecumseh handles the political aspects, align, resist white settlement, resist white treaty, <coughs> resist white uh, sales. The spiritual force, the prophet, Tenskwatawa, his brother, resist encroachment of, um, of our, I'm sorry, preserve our culture, resist white culture. They did this magnificent job of forming a confederation that stretched from Michigan and Wisconsin all the way down to Alabama and the borders of Florida. A frontier confederacy. <coughs> in 1810, Tecumseh enters into negotiations with William Henry Harrison to revoke the Treaty of Fort Wayne, which took away three million acres of hunting land. And Harrison and Tecumseh go through a very tense negotiation. Harrison knows Tecumseh's a genius. He knows he's behind the confederation. But Madison's not convinced. They do not revoke it. Harrison does an attack on their hometown, Tippecanoe in Indiana, the following year. And Tecumseh now goes out and seeks out an alliance with the British. Before that, he was thinking about it, but he didn't actively seek it out. The second stated cause in Madison's war message is a British-Indian alliance on the frontier. The irony is, is that we, in help, we helped in part create that alliance that we said Existed. Irony two. One of the stated cause we in fact helped to create. So the stated cause of the war didn't exist when the war began. One of the stated causes we helped to create. Third irony. Maybe the biggest cause was never stated. What was maybe the biggest cause for why we wanted to go to war with Great Britain in 1812? Land expansion? We wanted more land, which is <coughs> crazy. Louisiana Purchase isn't even 10 years old. We want more land. What land? Canadian. On to Canada. And what's this group of new young congressmen that are calling for Canada? Warhawks. Warhawks, like Henry Clay, John C. Calhoun, uh, 
they're calling for Canada. We need more land. It's a weird thing, but we're calling for it. But you can't say that to the American people because it sounds like an aggressive war. Basic principle, rule of thumb in war, America always tries to make it seem like defensive. We are defending something. So cause one, orders and council, impressment, ship seizures, we state over and over again as war message. Cause two, Indian Confederation attacking Americans and, and taking American land, we state. On to Canada, never said it is war message. And we go to war, Mr. Madison's war. Now, there's one other element that doesn't fit in neatly into this. The book emphasizes it well. Madison sees the end of neutrality. See, what Jefferson is emphasizing is neutrality. Neutrality is a principle in our foreign policy started with Washington. We're a young nation. We need to grow, become stronger. Neutrality. Eventually, using our resources, we'll be larger and more powerful than any European nation. But we've got to stay out of war. War is a European thing, not an American. That plays right into Jefferson's commerce as the only proper weapon of a civilized people. But by the time we get to Madison and this whole attack by two countries and all of this stuff, Madison makes the conclusion that you can't truly be an independent republic if you can't defend your interests. The end of neutrality is the War of 1812. That's an important principle. Obviously, from the preamble, what's the primary value that is expressed in that? the end of neutrality, and we have to go to war to defend our interests. What's the primary uh, principle? You just got to go through your list of the... This is a defensive war? Common defense. This is pr provide for a common defense. The military is built back up. We're going to defend our interests with our military. War of 1812, Mr. Nash emphasized rightly, battles are important, but one's really fun. The Battle of New Orleans creates a new hero for us, and he's going to be the first one of a few war heroes that run for and sometimes win the presidency. Who are we talking about? Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson. Know that. This, this tradition of, you know, post-Washington of finding war heroes is revived uh, as president. And just an interesting thing. The Battle of New Orleans ended 15 days after the treaty again ended the war. And the other element of the war that's kind of ironic is the treaty again is an armistice. An armistice is simply a ceasefire. Did you know that we could start the War of 1812 up tomorrow? Because there's no formal resolution to it. It's just a ceasefire. By the way, we could also start the Korean War up again tomorrow. You just connected time periods. Yes, One of the did. skills they want you to have. Uh, an armistice simply ends the conflict. By the way, we're also connecting Washington's foreign policy to Jefferson's foreign policy to now Madison changing foreign policy. Armistice? Armistice? What's the plural there? Armistice? <laughs> Armistice. Armistice. Uh, they just end fighting. They don't resolve the war. The war can be opened at any time. So the last irony of the War of 1812 is it returned all conditions. The treaty that ended it returned all conditions to as it was before the war began. It's a weird little war. Um, but it has significant event, a significant effect. Before we get to that effect, though, let's look at one kind of political tragedy, the Federalist. Uh, Federalists are rooted in what region of the, of the country? Northeast. What's that? Northeast. Northeast, New England. At this point, they're strongest there. Uh, they don't like this war. They don't like a war that's for adding new territory. They don't care about the Indian Confederation on the uh, West Coast. And by the way, Britain and them get along swell because of shipping and, and trade. They really never liked this war. So they get together after the burning of Washington. The war's going really bad. And they write up some protests, the Hartford Convention, Hartford, Connecticut. A series of protests of the War of 1812 and, and some really serious suggestions about how to change the Constitution. For instance, like if we're going to override a veto with a two-thirds vote, going to war should be a two-thirds vote. Uh, maybe embargo should have a two-thirds vote. Very specific suggestions. They wrap these up, they bundle them up, they travel down to Washington with about five representatives in January. Here's the sequence of news in Washington, D.C. About third week of uh, uh, January, we get news of Andrew Jackson won the Battle of New Orleans. Woo-hoo, it's a massive victory. Wow, we whooped him. A little less than a week after that, we get news of the treaty again. The war is over, and we wrongly assume that the British surrendered because of Jackson. And then those delegates from the Hartford Convention decide to put out their protest anyways. No. Go home. 
everybody's excited about winning the war that they presented it, and essentially is the beginning of the death of the Federalist Party. It is the, and here's key elements, key, it is an expression of sexualism at a moment of intense nationalism. Anytime we get to an end of a war we think we won, it's patriotism and nationalism, murk, murk, murk. That's the wrong time to say, but our region of the country is hurt. And they said, our region of the country is hurt by this war. And everybody looked down like you're unpatriotic, almost treasonous, and selfish. Wrong time, the Federalists start declining faster than they were already declining. They'll have exactly one more presidential candidate in 1816. And then the Federalists go out of existence for good. The death of the Federalist Party. Your book uses a great term to illustrate an interesting concept. They call it nascent nationalism. What does the word nascent mean? Some of mine, if you remember your vocab, you'll remember this word. Just like a little flower coming into bloom, or birth. What that argues is, up until 1815, we were always regions, states coming together. From the Arts Confederation, a loose alliance of sovereign states, to regional economies, trying to fit together. This is the first time the book argues that we're coming into bud or bloom as a nation. And it's going to play out in our policy now. Our policy is going to reflect that budding or nascent nationalism. And it's going to come from the Republicans, the Democratic Republicans, they call themselves Republicans. Uh, what is the legislation that really brings that idea into being? What's the, what's the legislation that brings that idea of nascent nationalism in, into being? Well, that's an easy one. Nationalism, nationalism, murk, murk, murk. Just said it. Oh my God, they're asleep, Mr. Nationalism. Put them to sleep. The American system, or as George Bush would call it, the American system. He always left off the first syllable of a lot of the words. Uh, and if they don't get good jokes like that, they're really asleep. Um, I think they're just hanging on your every word, Mr. Uplinger. It, no, that's what it comes to. Either that or there's no chance of fours and fives from the lack of response to any of these major because, questions. Because, by the way, he's got a point there. This tension between sexualism and nationalism in our history can be framed into so many questions. In foreign policy, this is economic policy. Economic policy, look what we learned before the War of 1812 and during the War of 1812. We didn't have a national economy. We didn't have one. So we say, we better have one, because war puts great tension or great stress on the economy, and we could ramp it up quick, because we have different elements in different areas of the country, and they're not connected. So Henry Clay, John C. Calhoun, and other congressmen say, we have to develop a truly national economy. But if you're wondering, this sounds familiar. The idea that you develop a truly national economy, it's not the first time it's been said in 1815. Who was the first one to say we have to have a truly national economy? Hamilton. And Hamilton was what party? Federal. And what party opposed every element of Hamilton's economic plan? The Republicans, the Democratic Republicans who are now, under Henry Clay and Calhoun, proposing a second national bank. Just like the first, but three and a half times larger. All the same functions, but it's capitalized at 35. <coughs> They're proposing a protected tariff, which, by the way, Hamilton proposed in the report of manufacture. It just didn't get passed. A protected tariff protects domestic industry against foreign competition by raising the price of foreign goods. We have to have an industry, not just an agriculture, but an industry. That's the wave of the future, just like Hamilton said in the report of manufacture. And they're going to propose what they call a bonus bill. Take money from the bank fee, take money from the tariff, and create internal improvements, roads and canals that connect the regions of the country, the agriculture of the South, the furs and mineral resources of the West, the budding manufacturing in the middle states along with wheat, with the manufacturing and shipping of New England. Take those sections, connect, make it a truly national economy. And just like Hamilton's plan, two-thirds of it gets passed. Well, actually, three-thirds get passed, but two-thirds become law. National Bank, passed and signed by President Madison. Uh, protected pair and tariff, about 20 to 25 percent, passed and signed by Madison. Internal Improvements Bill, passed, 
vetoed by Madison in one of his last official acts in 1817. Why? Article 1, Section 8, I think it's Clause 3, says that Congress can regulate commerce among the several states. Okay, that's great. But what's commerce? And this goes to strict constructionism. He gets this bill and he goes, federal money for roads and canals. That's transportation. The word transportation isn't in the Constitution, and transportation isn't commerce. That's a state area, not a federal area. This is strict interpretation of the Constitution by Madison. It also is a strict definition of commerce. What Madison's saying is if I go to the store and buy this bottle of water and give you money for it, the exchange of goods and services for money is commerce. How that water got to the store is not veto. A constitutional veto, another element you should think. Up until Jackson, you vetoed bills if you thought they were unconstitutional. Washington set that precedent and every president followed. Madison only vetoed it because he thought it was unconstitutional. He thought it was a good idea. It's not a kind of idea. Commerce is narrowly defined. Constitution is strictly defined. Veto. Interesting stuff. But we have the American system two thirds up and running. Uh, questions about any of that? So wait, the dominant political parties at the time were the Democratic Republicans. The Federalists were dying. Who else was prevalent in this political order? Well, you got them all. Oh, okay then. Between <laughs> there's only two parties. Okay. Uh, we're going to get to the two party versus one party here in a minute. Uh, it's the Federalists and Democratic Republicans, which by this time they're just calling themselves Republicans, because uh, there's very little competition. At this point, that's all we got. The federal funding for the bonus bill, was that the $1.5 million charter? Yes. Yeah. Uh, for the bank to become, it was $35 million capitalized. To become a national bank, you got to get a, 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 the charter approved, and there's a fee to it, and they put a $1.5 million fee. You take that $1.5 million? You added protective tariff money, and you got money for roads and canals. Other questions? So that's economic nationalism. And it involves two branches, legislative and executive. And we saw the interaction. Pass and sign, pass and sign, pass and veto, not overridden. There's a third branch, you know. And this third branch is under John Marshall. This is the Supreme Court of the United States, judicial branch. <coughs> and fortunately for America, if you want, if you like economic growth, it perfectly complemented what was going on with the legislative and executive branch. Perfectly. And the book highlights four cases. I'm leaving out Cohen's v. Virginia because I just don't think it's that important. I don't actually know why they put it in. Um, McCullough v. Maryland, Gibbons v. Ogden, um, Fletcher v. Peck, and Dartmouth College v. Woodward. All right? I'm just giving the basics and the ruling and emphasizing how it complements the American system and economic nationalism. McCullough v. Maryland, obviously, reinforces and makes constitutional the Bank of the United States. It, it protects the economic national interests, the good that a bank can do, against the state's rights to regulate or tax a national institution. Perfectly. Give, it gives the, the national bank and national government all the leeway it needs to direct and drive national investment in the economy. McCullough v. Maryland, 1819. Uh, Fletcher v. Peck um, and Dartmouth College v. Woodward, in different ways, both reinforce the sanctity of contracts. Article 1, Section 10 of the Constitution says that Congress cannot interfere uh, with contracts. Uh, it forbids, uh, excuse me, forbids states from interfering with the obligation of contracts. Fletcher v. Peck is very difficult to understand the background, likewise with Dartmouth College. I'll just be wasting your time. Very complex. But in both instances, state legislatures tried to change existing contracts. And Marshall's court said you can't. Because what that does is it, it creates people's, it creates loss of faith in the sanctity of contracts. Therefore, people will be less likely to enter into less economic activity. And finally, Gibbons v. Ogden is a commerce thing. It's very important. I saved it last for a reason. 1824, uh, some guy named, uh, uh, oh God, I always forget. I think it's Gibbons that has the federal coasting license and Ogden that had the state monopoly. And the monopoly would exclude the federal coasting license. Federal law, state law. 
Supreme Court decides in favor of the federal law, overrides the state monopoly, and gives him opportunity. But the real thing here is how it defines commerce. Commerce isn't just the exchange of goods and services. It's transportation as well. If you define commerce as transportation, the steamboat travel up to Hudson, how goods get to stores, roads and canals that offer that transportation, is commerce. Once you have that, Congress, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3, can regulate it. Now you can have internal improvement bills. It really opens it up. And John Quincy Adams is the president that's going to really make it, take advantage of that. Okay? So judicial nationalism reinforced economic nationalism done by the legislature and the president. All three branches come together and thrust us forward into building a truly national economy. Uh, even where we went wrong, if you want a national economy, the veto of the, uh, the internal improvements went right, because what the states did pick it up a little bit. What state particularly picked up the responsibility of internal improvements? And what do they build? Even then, our states picked it up, and Erie Canal is why New York is the biggest port in the country uh, at that time and later, because it, it was the first East Coast city to be connected to the Midwest and all the development there, the Erie Canal. Uh, so that's that. Now we're going to get to foreign policy nationalism, and then that'll close out. Essentially, they are good feelings with one thing. I separate this into two, all right? And if you go to, uh, well, well, hold on that a minute. You have establishment of national boundaries and you have establishment of diplomatic boundaries. All right, establishment of national boundaries and establishment of diplomatic boundaries. If you're a real nerd in college and you want to debate some night uh, who's the greatest secretary of state ever, first of all, you're not going to have a lot of friends. Um, <laughs> you're just not. Um, second of all, you might be very happy. If you do, and third of all, I would grant that you should probably conclude as John Quincy Adams. John Quincy Adams, what he does in, uh, I don't have a lot of friends, just in case you want John Quincy, <laughs> I, I heard a pity talk over there. He, he's not making that up. Yeah, it's yeah, true. he's not. Yeah, yeah. Where is Thank you, Sam, for reinforcing that. You have a lot of friends um, on Facebook, though. I'll be your friend. Thank you. Thank you. Um, John Quincy Adams achieves remarkable things as James Monroe, Secretary of State. Of all of these, the rush Badjo agreement is the only one he doesn't, uh, he's not really responsible for. rush Badjo is a treaty between the United States and Great Britain. He militarizes the Great Lakes. How do you, how do you spell that? Badjo, I say Badjo, some people say Bago. Uh, it's a silent T, B-A-G-O-T. Right. Rush is Richard Rush, the American negotiator. He militarizes shared usage of the uh, Great Lakes with Great Britain. The Convention of 1818 is very important in connecting between time periods and very important in the issue of manifest destiny. <coughs> it solidifies the northern boundary of Louisiana territory at the 49th parallel, makes it a straight line, and is an agreement of uh, uh, shared use or joint occupation of Oregon. And Oregon goes all the way up to the 5440 parallel. My, into modern day Vancouver and Canada, all right? Shared use of Oregon, that's 1818. And the Adams of Nice or Transcontinental Treaty, I don't know which way they will say it, is the southern and western boundaries of Louisiana and Oregon, southern and western boundaries, and also a purchase of Florida for about five million. We pay off Spain's debt, we purchase Florida for five million. In successive years, 1817, 1818, 1819, it's, re it's really remarkable because America had gained land so fast that we never took the time to solidify and clarify our boundaries. In successive years after the War of 1812, we do that. It's very important that we do that. But we're not done. John Quincy Adams has this idea that we got to go beyond that. We got to establish short diplomatic boundaries. Otherwise, Europe is going to come here and really threaten us. You know, because now Napoleon's gone. Things are resolved. Europe's going to act with energy. Look out, here they come. Especially one country is imploding. Anybody know which European country is basically just doing a fire sale every year of their colonies? France? No. Well, who did we just get Florida from? Spain. They're losing Central America, South America, top of South America. 
Uh, Mexico's about to win independence if we get Florida. Spain is losing land right and left because it's weak. And the rest of Europe is talking about coming and restoring some of these, bringing them back to the monarchy. And the United States doesn't want that. No, no, no. We want those nice, young, independent countries for our use. So they come up with this weird thing, Monroe Doctrine, where we essentially claim the Western Hemisphere. Not colonization, not intervention. Europe don't intervene in the affairs of existing independent countries, and you're not colonizing anymore here. Also, you got Russia coming down over Alaska and the Bering Strait. Any threat from Europe would say, no. We can't enforce it. We can. But it works, oddly. Because Europe, it's, 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 I always liken it to like a five-year-old screaming at you from a playground. You're really going to go over and hit it? Um, really, it's heavy. Uh, um, we're so young and so weak. Europe could crush us. But we're, we're mouthing off to them anyways. Western Hemisphere is ours. It's just a matter of mutual interest that it doesn't resolve in some. But it works. Uh, brilliant statement by Quincy Adams gets James Monroe's name on it, Monroe Doctrine. That essentially does the air good feelings, but there's one element left. It's that sexualism thing again. Sexualism began the era of good feelings with the Hartford Convention and was crushed. Federalists go out of existence. Era of good feelings becomes an era of nationalism, patriotism, and one political party, the Republicans. But just underneath the surface of the era of good feelings is a sectional issue. It's just waiting to bubble to the surface. What's that? And it bubbles to the surface in the Midwest. First state first territory to apply for statehood in the Louisiana Territory, west of the Mississippi, is. And the application comes in 1819. And uh, at this point, we're at 11-11. 11, 11. 11 slave states, 11 free states, nice balance. And balance is important in which House of Congress? What's that? No, see the House, it's always going to be imbalanced. It's important in the Senate. The House is always going to be imbalanced in favor of which region? The North. Because population. The House is always going to be the North. That's why the South has to have to be at least equal in the Senate. Um, so 11 11 is what we have. And now Missouri comes in and they apply as a slave state. First one, Louisiana. And the North isn't having it. They offer the Talmadge Amendment, gradual emancipation. And the South isn't going to have that. And it fails. So now we come to this impasse, and the great compromiser begins his name. We just talked about him today. Henry Clay. Henry Clay is a great legislator, maybe America's greatest legislator. However, what makes a great legislator, seeing both sides of an issue and coming to some resolution in the middle, does not necessarily make a great political candidate. He's going to lose the presidency, for, or losing the race for presidency. But that quality of being able to see both sides and coming up with compromise affects the Compromise of 1820. Uh, Missouri come in as a slave state, separate Maine from Massachusetts as a free state, uh, and set a line going forward in Louisiana. Take the bottom of Missouri across, 36-30 line, north, open to slavery, or excuse me, close to slavery, south, open to slavery. Uh, now we're 12-12 in the Senate, balance is maintained, and what some people feel was that budding civil wars averted. First of a couple of times that Clay's going to do that. Um, so that one expression of sexualism has calmed down for a time. Uh, questions on the air of good feelings? There's a lot there. Yes? John Quincy Adams did not want to involve Great Britain in this. Um, um, he said, we'll be like a tugboat in the, in the, in the wake of a great, uh, not ocean liner, but ship. If you ever seen a ship that parts the water, you know, we'll be like a little tugboat. That's the wake. We'll be, he says, we can't do it. It's got to be our expression. We've got to assert our nationalism. All right? um, so there was no agreement with Great Britain to enforce Monroe Doctrine. But a history professor of mine in college always asked this question, what's more important in history, what was actually true or what was perceived to be true? And he always made the argument, what, what was perceived to be true? And what was perceived to be true in Europe was that Great Britain was the enforcement behind it. Which is another reason 
why it just wasn't challenged. They felt that Great Britain's probably behind this, so they didn't challenge us. That in distance. Uh, other questions? All right, I'm just kind of looking at if there's any other principles here. Uh, uh, I would like to say that Manifest Destiny is not something that began, you know, in, I don't know, Unit 6 or whatever unit we put it in. I mean, think of it. The idea that we beat Great Britain is crazy. We want our independence from Great Britain. Nuts. That we go to negotiate the treaty for Great Britain and double our size. We're just going to try to get uh, negotiate a treaty to end the revolution and recognize their independence, we come back with all land east of the Mississippi. That's crazy. Twenty years later, Napoleon gives up on uh, his western empire and sells his land for like four cents an acre, Louisiana Purchase. Crazy. We double our size again. War of 1812, we survive a second war with Great Britain. That's crazy. Florida is sold to us for five million. Again, where's this all coming from? The, the idea of Manifest Destiny is in our minds well before the newspaper editor in the 1840s, John L. O'Sullivan, coins it. This is the idea that we are God's chosen people and that the continent is ours. And in the solidification of those treaties, after the War of 1812, we are all the way to the Pacific with the shared use of global war God. So Manifest Destiny is an element here that you should be able to trace from, ours, from, our, from our revolution all the way up to California Gold Rush. So I wanted to get that in uh, today. Uh, sexualism, regionalism, uh, strict construction versus loose construction. Marshall uses loose construction. He reads in constitutionality, necessary and proper clause for the bank. He, he expands the definition of commerce. He liberally applies contract interpretation. Marshall is a loose constructionist. Though in Madison, Marbury versus Madison, he was a strict constructionist. But loose construction versus strict construction is something you should start thinking about as well. Uh, I think that's enough. Let's get to the end of an era. That's how I, 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 I label the, uh, the election of 1824 the end of an era. If you're going to call the era good feelings, one party system, nationalism, the end of that is the election of 1824. Just maybe the funnest election in the entire history of the United States. Starts off with five candidates. One drops out to run for vice president, John C. Calhoun. Five becomes four. Now you're four candidates. The four candidates are Andrew Jackson from Tennessee, John Quincy Adams from Massachusetts, <coughs> William Crawford from Georgia, Henry Clay from Kentucky. They have the election. The Electoral College, four becomes three. Because Henry Clay has the fewest votes, he's eliminated. The other three, there's no majority. Jackson got the most, but there's no majority. So four becomes three, 12th Amendment sends it to the House of Representatives. Before it gets to the representative vote, three become two. Anybody know why? Oh wow, a lot of people remember this. Poor oh, guy had a stroke. He still gets votes, remarkably. But um, he's not a serious candidate. So now three becomes two. It's down between Quincy Adams and Jackson. And I always ask the question on my test this way. Explain how the first man eliminated in the Electoral College becomes the most important person in the election. He was in the House of Representatives and they had to choose who left as president. But let's get his position in the House of Representatives. He's the most powerful. He's Paul Ryan. Uh, probably a far more powerful Paul Ryan. Speaker of the House. And he's swinging. He's using all his advantages. Swing the vote. Which way? Yeah. Now, Jackson calls this a corrupt bargain, and there is some historical, there were meetings, there were dinners, you know, that kind of thing. But honestly, I think there's arguments on the other side. A, they were both nationalists. They have both agreed on issues. They are together on tariffs, the bank, the American system, foreign policy, they agree. Two, Clay and Jackson viscerally hate each other. Why would you support a guy you hate? He only mildly dis Clay only mildly dislikes Quincy Adams. Uh, uh, so there's arguments on the other side, too. And that's the way the Constitution works, so he swings the vote that way. Uh, Jackson is furious. Especially when, soon after, Quincy Adams gave <coughs> what position to uh, uh, Clay? Uh, 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 Secretary of State. Now let's review. Who was, who was Washington's Secretary of State? He was Vice President. Huh? 
Thomas Jefferson becomes the third president. Who is Jefferson's Secretary of State? Becomes fourth president. Madison Jefferson's Secretary of State. He becomes president. Monroe's Secretary of State. He becomes president. Doesn't it sound like, Mr. Clay, you make me president this time, I'll make you president next time? I mean, I get Jackson's argument. There's arguments on both sides. But either way, it's the end of the era of good feelings. There are no more political good feelings. The Republican Party as a singular party is over because the day, the day after the election, Jackson started campaigning. Um, and he's now saying, he, he's reviving that idea of Democratic Republican. We are Democratic Republicans. I was the Democratic choice. Starts in on the, uh, that. Well, you can't be the anti-Federalist, we learned that. You have to be something. So we're the Nationalist Republicans. And the birth of a second party, the two-party system again. Nationalist Republicans are for protective tariffs, uh, are for active government involvement and development of national economy. They're not laissez-faire. They want government to help create uh, the right kind of uh, economies. Uh, and Quincy Adams, such an interesting guy, and he gets no love in history because he didn't accomplish much. Obstructionism. Highest, highest IQ of any president. Is it really? Yes. Wow, I didn't know that. Wow, I did not know that. That's, that's interesting. Quincy Adams, when you look at it, he's so far ahead of his time. First person to ever invite somebody non-white to the White House, Creek Indian tribe chiefs, who he, he, he signed a treaty, and he didn't like the treaty, and he invited them to come and talk to him. He wanted to be humane, very ahead of his time there. He wanted an observatory. He wanted to study the stars, and he wanted federal money for it. He put federal money into internal improvements. He wanted a national university, way ahead of his time, and almost none of it got done. <laughs> I mean, none of it got done. That's why he's ranked down there as president. But it was because of political obstructionism, uh, something that we can experience right now. Uh, political obstructionism is not a new thing. It didn't start with Bush or Obama or Trump, uh, the opposition party. It is a long history, and, and this is a great instance of it. That and the fact that Quincy Adams, though smart, was a horrible politician. He did not, he only had 12 appointments in four years. No spoil system there. Um, and he wasn't personally warm, and uh, he was kind of arrogant. So he wasn't a big winner in building coalitions. No Henry Clay. So he doesn't accomplish much. That's why we don't give him much love. But he is way ahead of his time. His accomplishments are in the future by somebody else. Also, the only president to go what we call down to the House of Representatives, what a magnificent representative he was. So uh, he was one of our great representatives as well. Quincy Adams deserves a place in our history. I think he deserves a statue. What do I know? Um, anyways, um, so we get to the year of 1828. A couple changes, and here's some theme stuff. In our Constitution, we the people met who again? The citizens. Now, nah, be more specific. Yeah, you weren't, you weren't in the we the people. I mean, you were, but not as a political agent. Yeah. White male property owners. In the period between 1824 and 18, by the way, did you know 1824 is the first election in the history of our country where they counted popular votes? Up until then, state legislatures just picked the electors. 1824, they counted popular votes. And even in the election of 1824, it was like seven or eight states had no popular vote whatsoever. By 1828, we're down to, I think, two. And by 1832, South Carolina is the only one not having a popular vote. This is a period where the Electoral College begins to be a reflection of the popular vote. Two, um, this is the period where Western states start eliminating the property qualification. And it's Eastern states that now come in and start amending their constitutions. Like all the new states as they were writing the constitu Constitution said white male taxpayers. So the property qualification goes away. So what now you have have are more voters, more politically engaged. And then when you add in the mudslinging campaign, oh, is that fun? Higher literacy, more newspapers talking about John Quincy Adams being a pimp in Russia. Well, <laughs> I'm listening. He wasn't. Uh, but that was the stupid charge. Uh, or that uh, he has gambling tables. He had a pool table. Uh, but he has gambling tables in the White House. Or 
Now, Jackson's mom's a whore. I don't know. I mean, there's no record of Jackson's upbringing. I don't know, but he was poor. Uh, or that he was an adulteress. And that Rachel Jackson, that's an important one. Because she is so stressed by this that even after he wins the election handily, uh, she passes away in December, never sees him inaugurated. Jackson blames Clay and never forgives him uh, for that particular one. But this is a mudslinging, modern <coughs> kind of campaign. And all of that leads to three times the number of voters in 1828 is 1824. Well, it starts. That's the first one where the popular vote is counted. By the time we get to 1828, three times the number of voters, uh, or 300% increase in the number of voters. So this is the point at which in the presidential campaign, we go from not having popular vote to having a popular vote to really having a popular vote. Since you said that, um he did in 1824, but he didn't get the majority in either. Uh, other questions about that? So now enter Andrew Jackson, common man. <coughs> Interesting. A man of the common people, but relatively uncommon. May have been the wealthiest man in all Tennessee. Uh, this ring true? Yeah. Uh, the favorite of the working class is a very, very, very wealthy man. Hmm. Uh, the Hermitage is his great plantation in Tennessee, but there's more truth to his story about being a common man than Trump's. As opposed to having a modest million dollar loan from his father, he truly was raised in this little shanty log cabin in Carolina somewhere. They don't even know which Carolina. Uh, very little record. He is self-made. Uh, and uh, works his way up through the military, has great accomplishment uh, in the military and even after. He is a self-made man and people start looking at him as what's possible for them. The whole idea of the rule of the common man is if Jackson can go from nothing to the presidency, what can I do? Uh, I would like it across time frames, I really do liken it this way, to Obama being elected. Because up until Obama's election, I couldn't really look at people and you know, and say, well, he could be president, because it wasn't thought that minorities would be president. But I thought if a man named Hussein as his middle name, Barack is first and Obama's last, maybe it's possible. A similar kind of thing happened with Jackson. Up until Jackson, every one of the presidents was uncommon. Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, these are uncommon people, Quincy Adams. Jackson was common. He didn't spell well, he didn't speak well, he had bullets in his body, he's president. Changes everything. He also changes government, spoil system. So the victor goes to spoils. Quincy Adams mm -hmm. had 12 appointments. Jackson had a lot. If you support me, I support you. If you support me, I get you a job. Uh, he doesn't put it into place as much as history gives him credit for, but he starts that process. Uh, and boy, is he a battler in politics. Here's where Jackson, or here's where Trump has some basis for comparison. He's, this guy doesn't, he's blood sport when it comes to politics. And he wins most every battle. And Trump's not winning too many right now. <laughs> um, by the way, did you hear the thing that Trump's doing right now with Jackson? Yeah. He said Jackson would have averted the Civil War from the grave. Jackson died in 1845. When you hear that quote, trust me, Trump just doesn't know history. It's, it's really <laughs> tragic. Uh, history teachers die a little bit when we hear this. So back to Trump. Let's get to the political battle that we fought and won. Uh, let's go with the first one first. In his first inaugural address, he talks about uh, Native American removal. Uh, he's asking Congress to pass for the Indian, uh, uh, the Indian Removal Act of 1830. He gets it. His arguments are much like previous presidents. One, we need treaties. For treaties, we need money. So he's going to Congress and saying, give me the supplies, and the money allocation to negotiate treaties. That's what the Indian Removal Act is. That's perfectly consistent with what everybody from Washington did. Washington's administration was the one that said, uh, Indian tribes are foreign nations within our boundaries. We have to treat them as such. Therefore, we negotiate with them. We have treaties and all the rest. Jackson's consistent with He's also consistent in that he sees our expansion as an economic issue. And that we can make more of this land than what Native Americans do. Uh, 
Where he differs a little bit is in, again, the ruthlessness of his approach. He's, he's, he's really going after him. Uh, the Indian Removal Act, 1830. He asks for and gets it. He also has an unprecedented kind of challenge constitutionally. It's in Jackson's presidency that Wooster v. Georgia is passed for, uh, by the Supreme Court, or decided by the Supreme Court. John Marshall. In a dispute between Georgia and the Cherokee Nation, Georgia, Marshall recognizes the Cherokee Nation as an independent, uh, uh, independent uh, uh, culture, society, I forget the word, with distinct political boundaries within which their authority is exclusive. Georgia's law can have no force in Cherokee land. They won. The Cherokee don't ever have to sign a treaty. Uh, but Jackson famously says, Marshall's made a decision, let him enforce it. I'm enforcing the Indian Removal Act. And he pursues a treaty. When the Cherokee find out that this is, Jackson's just not going to enforce it, Jackson actually told Cher Georgians, go light a fire on them. You know, go on to their land. In violation of the Supreme Court, he said to Georgians, go on to their land. In violation of the Supreme Court. It's worse than I'm not enforcing it. He actively undermined who was to be Georgia. And the Cherokee realized, uh-oh, this, this, we're never going to get him to recognize. He's not going to enforce his own treaty. So some Cherokee get together without authorization, sign the Treaty of the Chota. We have a signature. We have a treaty. Senate passes it by one vote. And we're going to remove him. And the ultimate destination of that is the Trail of Tears. It is a great constitutional question. I don't, I'm waiting for them to put it on. By the Cherokee Constitution, which is model on ours, the Treaty of Neutro is absolutely wrong. Their president makes treaties just like ours does. Their president was nowhere around when this thing was made. It violates their constitution, which they modeled on ours, which we helped them write. By our constitution, we have a treaty with a signature. In the Senate rally, <coughs> and Jackson's enforcing it. He has his right. The answer is probably somewhere in between. Uh, I lean towards the Cherokee. The outcome, Trail of Tears, 15,000 removed, 4,000 died, and, and in the process from Cherokee to land designated by the Indian Removal Act west of the Mississippi, Monterey, Oklahoma. Included in all of this is assimilation. Cherokee were one of the five civilized tribes. And we considered civilized to be more like us. They assimilated or took on our characteristics, making them more civilized. In his, one of his last annual messages, Jackson says, it's an established fact that they cannot live in contact with the civilized people and prosper. Cherokee were prosperous, they were doing well, they beat us in our own court, and we removed them anyways. That's why John Quincy Adams' quote is very important. Quincy Adams says, <laughs> it's not even about assimilation. He says, the point at which our benevolence towards Native Americans ends is where our interests be. That's an apt, apt description throughout history, even as you go all the way up to the wounded knee. Second issue is tariffs. How much time do we have? What time is it? 4.15. 4.15? Okay, that's fine. So we'll end it there. Uh, because, by the way, I think we pick it up there on the video, and it's 4.15, and I can see you guys waning a little bit. Any questions before we end? The other two, two issues are tariff and National Bank. National Bank leads into the Panic of 1837. And Van Buren and Harrison are a quick one, and you go to Manifest Destiny. So the other video will have that for you. It's online. <coughs> Thank you for your time.